Hi there. About four years ago, I produced a video on the time lapse app called Lapsit for smart ass phones. And it's a fantastic app. It was then, but now, four years later, there have been many more features. The only gripe I have <laughs> is that the interface has changed now to a Technicolor interface. But that aside, the power that's in that app now is fantastic for time lapse for your smartphone. So, let's see how it works. Okay, I'm coming from this review almost as a complete novice, due to the fact I haven't used it for a couple of years. So, this is not a thorough run through because I do think it's quite complex and I've not been able to find any comprehensive guide on how to use some of its more technical features. So, bear with me. Cheers. Okay, you can't miss the app. There it is. Boom, we'll open it. I've got it in vertical mode, principally because it's easier to set up all these icons down here. If we start to the left, we'll set up all the parameters via all these various icons. So first of all, we have HDR enabled or disabled. <laughs> High dynamic range. Location. I would disable this, particularly if you find yourself in Area 51 for some reason, or the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Yeah, <laughs> we'll disable it. RAW. Now you can shoot RAW, JPEG, and RAW only, or you can disable it and just shoot JPEG. I've not tried this, to be honest. This is an iPhone 7 Plus. I would love the 12 Pro, but wife says no at the moment. So I will disable it for now. Right, next thing. Depth. If enabled, it switches to your telephoto lens. It can be used to create FX that treat foreground and background elements differently. It's like the portrait mode in iOS camera app, but animated over time. Hmm, interesting. But a guide on how to use it would be useful. Bracket. You can select each time-lapse frame to be over or underexposed by one or more stops, each side of correct exposure. This is useful, I guess. So capturing three frames is probably all you need. Either that or capturing RAW. Shutter speed on phones is what sets the exposure in the first place. There's no apertures to set. So I would get the ISO down to its minimum. You know, in this case, it happens to be 22. And then just get an, a, set an its suitable exposure. We're overexposing there. We're against a white background here. We're backlight through a window, as you can see. Normally, I would set it manual. If the light throughout the day, throughout your exposure, your time lapse is going to be fairly consistent. Blue sky day, for example. But if you're shooting in the evening, I would go there maybe for continuous, particularly if you're going to be doing a sunrise, because then the exposure will not blow out later as the sun comes up and gets brighter and so on. But going darker into a sunset and into night, that's fine generally. But you can always try continuous. I mean, after all, this is all for experimentation, really. Focus. Well, yeah, keep it fixed. Focus on your subject. Where's the subject? That's screen cleaner, by the way. Tap on the outside. Right, that's set now. Yeah, keep the focus locked all times. The very first thing to do, if you don't want your time lapse to be interfered with anyway, put it into airplane mode. Otherwise, you'll get these interruptions. White balance. Generally, the phone's camera app will set a good auto white balance. If not, play around with temperature and tint until you're happy, then press fixed. I don't even notice that sign saying, my camera phone is not supported, so cannot measure. <laughs> Dull. Then low light disabled or enabled. Yes, if you're shooting in towards a, a, a sunset and it's going down, you may want to have that enabled so that it actually does capture some sort of detail in the sky. So we'll enable that. Uh, stabilization disabled, unless you're doing it handheld, doing a sort of a hyperlapse, then keep that uh, disabled. I tried it with this phone, but um, now it still seemed very shaky. Color space, sRGB or P3? Well, P3 color gives about a 25% improvement over sRGB. It's an extension to it, so may as well use it. JPEG standard or HEIC efficient? Yeah, go for HEIC efficient because it crunches JPEGs down to about half their file size. So uh, that's good if you're going to do a very long and lots of time lapse with very little loss of quality, if at all. Save path device. Here you can output to the cloud or to your device onto your camera roll. Onion skin. What the heck's that, you may ask? Well, we'll come back to it later as it's used as an aid when using stop motion. Grid. An aid to composition and framing. And you can just see the grid there. Here we have interval. Now, one little gripe. Why milliseconds? Us photographers work on half, quarter of a second, eighth, 15, 30, 60, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, minutes in an hour are quite self-explanatory. But when you get to milliseconds, yeah, you think, oh, God, what's half a second then? Well, it's 200. It must be 200 milliseconds. It'd be much quicker. And then, you know, four, quarter of a second is 400, I guess, and, and so on. 
Okay, so as I fiddle and faff around with this app, trying to get to grips with it, let's try a bit of stop motion because I think that's a really good feature on this particular update on the app. This movie camera is a Bolex D8LA, triple N, standard eight millimeter cine camera from 1962. Exposure looks fine by default. So next we will enable onion skin, which will probably bring me to tears of laughter. Okay, we're going to take two shots for every movement as I rotate the camera through 360 degrees. First of all though, we'll zoom up to about 25 frames. That's roughly a second before we start the actual movement that is. But then you'll see how onion skin, when enabled, superimposes the previous shot over the next and this really helps with alignment. Stop motion is found by touching on interval and this will take us to the button on the far left of screen. I'm not gonna show the whole process because like me, you'll probably end up losing the will to live. I already have. Nearly. <laughs> okay, so 25 frames is roughly one second, so now we're going to move it. And I'll speed this process up while I shoot two frames for every movement as forementioned. And a Bluetooth button, by the way, is advisable to use for this to avoid camera shake. It's a little too tight in the frame, so we'll animate it back a touch. And finish off with a few more frames. So 112 frames captured. Next press, finished capture, which I've almost cropped out of the frame, dull. But now we're presented with a summary showing the duration of the lapse being four seconds. Before exporting, you can add a title, no idea how to work that, unable to display a keyboard, no information further than that, but can display a date and timestamp. The project can be rotated and reversed and a frames catalog displays all 112 frames where if necessary, you can delete the odd frame if needed. Touch on editor to shorten, crop, duplicate, split and delete a segment. Just slide the green start or the red end, the red end, <laughs> to adjust and crop your stop motion masterpiece. Now we'll go to FX and we'll apply an enhancement such as vibrance, although this is more appropriate for color images to be honest. But I did it anyway, don't know why. Most of these color effects are rubbish, but sepia, black and white, infrared, which works best for subjects with lots of greenery and big cumulus clouds with a blue sky. That's what infrared's for, really. This is a more suitable subject for infrared. Touch on soundtrack to add music or do voiceovers. I think maybe I've already done enough of these. Let's play it back a moment. Mm, genius, now let's see in full frame. Magic. <laughs> now, nice little camera, this Bolex. Nothing digital about it, of course. It's an icon from the retro days of home movie making, yeah. Before we finally export our project, here we have the option of changing the output resolution, frame rate, output quality, and format. The resolution's at 1080p by default, I believe. Output quality high, but let's go extreme, because I'm an extreme kind of guy. For output format, use HEVC as it compresses the file down by at least 40%, as opposed to JPEG. Okay, close that off and hit export. This will take quite some time with a long project, obviously. Great, now you can play the video. The Speed Editor takes you to a separate app which you have to download and pay for, but allows further enhancements. We'll skip that. Save to photo library, and of course you can share it out to various social media. So, there it is, in glorious black and white. But you get the picture, literally, the movie picture. Okay, so what are my views on Lapsit? Well, I would say there are some fantastic additions to this app which makes it a very powerful time-lapse tool. But at the same time, it's a bit of a minefield to work through and requires a lot of practice. As I mentioned in my introduction, getting back to grips with this app made me feel like a complete newbie. But if I can do it, you can do it. There are tons of options to explore, to try and suss out. So yes, I'd recommend it, particularly if you're a genius. <laughs> Cheers, thanks for watching, see you soon.